It's been a little difficult finding fresh topics in a game that turns five years old this March. Bloodborne, and if I'm being honest, the Soulsborne community in general has probably one of the most dedicated player bases I've ever really made content for. And it sucks being this late to the punch because I feel like most of the subjects and hacks and otherwise really cool finds have all been unearthed and dusted off pretty thoroughly by the rest of the community. But I sifted through my older videos and as I was doing that, I eventually found a very old Bloodborne video that I did way back in 2015. And after watching it back and realizing how much I could have done differently and all the things I could have tweaked, I started thinking about what it would have looked like if I tried my hand at this topic now as compared to then. Year beginnings are the perfect time for introspection and self-criticism, and what better way to measure your progress than by reconceptualizing one of your oldest pieces of content. So please lend me your attention, because I'm going to be showing you my 10 creepiest locations in all of Bloodborne. Deep in the outskirts of the Cathedral Ward, you'll probably run into a large troop of riflemen and their hunting dogs. And guarded by these riflemen is a long-abandoned district that now serves as a cemetery for Yarnum's deceased. Few things are more terrifying than being chased by a mob of hags with meat cleavers and various gardening equipment. And this is kind of why Hemwick Charnel Lane was one of the first instances in Bloodborne, for me at least, where I felt genuinely paranoid about what enemies would be lurking around any given corner. The Grave Women do a surprising amount of damage with their weapons, and they're also much faster than they look. You can hear their mumbling and whispering if you get closer to them, which usually gives away their position and takes away the shock value, but if you aggro one of them, it's usually not without sending at least another two or three your way as well. And these enemies can be extremely frustrating to deal with in groups. I think what unsettled me the most about this area was just the lack of music. It really does put into perspective just how well Bloodborne excels at making these really immersive soundscapes. You're not going to be hearing any looming drones or notes, but instead the creaking of dilapidated old wood, barn doors swinging back and forth in the wind, and the unsound ramblings of the grave women patrolling around Hemwick. And I haven't even made it to the creepiest part, which is the appearance of these oddities called the Mad Ones. They're extremely tall, wield garden sickles, and attack you with a startling amount of energy. It's one of Bloodborne's many optional areas in the game, which I think is a damn shame, because this place is enriched with some of the most interesting level design I think Bloodborne has to offer. The idea that you're trespassing on the territory of a witch in Hemwick Castle just gives the whole area this really weird aura that does a great job at making you feel vulnerable and paranoid. This next area took me much longer to find than I would probably care to admit. I think that's why it was so unsettling to me. I had never been aware of the fact that getting killed by one of the Snatchers would actually result in them essentially kidnapping you and taking you to a jail far off somewhere in the crannies of Yarnum, the Hypogean Jail. And yes, it also took me much longer than it should have to realize that word was actually a foreign spelling of the word jail, has probably one of the scariest reveals, I'll say. If you looked this area up on a wiki or a walkthrough or something, getting access to this area kind of loses a large portion of its impact because most of what makes the jail so unnerving is the idea that you are being sent back to the hunter's refuge, or at least you think, and then you discover that you've been placed in one of these large burlap sacks carried by the Snatchers. By triggering this event, you get a chance to explore some of your Hargul before the Blood Moon ritual stage in Bloodborne's story, and somehow the village of Yahargul manages to be 
just as creepy before this phase as it is during. A lot of the village is closed off, but the indoors area is inhabited almost completely by these snatcher enemies. And, uh, goddamn, they, uh, they hit hard. During the phase of the Blood Moon Ritual, the lamp that gives the hunter access to the jail has been broken, presumably by the Mensis hunters that didn't want said ritual to be interrupted. The Origin of the Ashen Blood Plague Old Yarnum gives the player some insight as to where the plague started and Yarnum's knee-jerk reaction to its spreading. Old Yarnum is enriched with lore and information, and that's kind of what's scary about it, in my opinion. The valleys of Old Yarnum are made to look very unwelcoming to both beasts and hunters alike. The beasts tied to burning crucifixes at the town's entryway exhibit a warning to the beasts, and although it looks threatening, it didn't really stop the scourge from spreading the way it did. And this is where hunters realized just how important of a tool that fire was to the cleansing of beasts. And the hunters used it so ubiquitously, in fact, that they ended up burning down the greater parts of the city in their efforts to push back against the scourge. As a result, this district of Yarnum has long been abandoned and completely overrun with poisonous beasts. On top of an old dilapidated tower is where an old hunter, Jura, the last of the powder kegs, takes refuge. He swears that the beasts inhabiting the decaying town are of no threat to the Yarnamites that live above the valleys, and if you choose to hunt them anyways, he will not take kindly to it. The lecture building is what I would assume to once be part of either the School of Mensis or the Bergenworth College you find at the end of the Forbidden Woods beside the lake. But whatever this building used to be a part of, it now drifts helplessly in the void of the hunter's nightmare. The lecture building is still inhabited by some of its students who have now been deformed and morphed into these slug-like beings. And this makes a ton of sense, considering Cause assumes the appearance of a massive sea-dwelling slug-like creature. Now, I'm not gonna get too much into the lore of Bloodborne here because, well, because this video would end up being like 40 minutes longer than it should be, but this would make sense as to why all of the scholars in the building were transformed into these slugs. There's one classroom in particular that's actually still seated with scholars, and I believe this is to insinuate that the scholars have become so deformed and so absent-minded that they're still sitting here occupying the room and awaiting their professor's return even after all these years. And I just think that's the creepiest shit in the world, if I'm being honest. A lot of this area's eeriness just comes from the fact that your first-hand discovering the consequences of what some of the Bergenworth experiments led to, just the way the scholars creep around the secluded hallways of the theater, and the way they move so, well, I guess, sluggishly, has always kind of spooked me a little. Of course, mentioning this area as a creepy location without mentioning the appearance of patches would be a total loss. And if you're like me and you went through the game in the most linear way possible your first way through, this is probably the first time you'll have met patches in Bloodborne. You likely would have skipped out on the alternate path of the building that involves the tonsil stone and took the more common route by accessing the site of the Mensis ritual in the Advent Plaza. This whole building just creates a really unsettling atmosphere, especially knowing the infrastructure isn't really connected to anything physical, or at least that's what you're left to assume. You are in a part of what either used to be attached to the School of Mensis, or could have been a section of Bergenworth that's just drifting along in the Nightmare Realm. It's just a really helpless feeling. And, fittingly, the Nightmare of Mensis is equally terrifying for that exact same reason. For this is where you begin discovering the inner dregs of the Hunter's Nightmare, and just how twisted and demented this place really is. 
I would say this is the single most climactic area of Bloodborne's vanilla story. Everywhere you look, you see valleys and floating masses of bones, flesh, and all this rotting viscera, and it all gives way to a secluded loft in the nightmare. This is where you're going to find the two boss fights, Mikalash and the Wet Nurse. Mikalash, who is assumed to be the head of the School of Mensis, whose experiments were meant to be discreet, and even the knowledge that the school existed in the first place was meant to be kept away from Yarnamites. And now that we see the consequences of said experiments laid bare in the Nightmare of Mensis, it's really no wonder Mikalash and the rest of the school wanted their work to be kept secret. On top of the Nightmare area, having one of the most miserable backstories in Bloodborne, it's also home to some of the grisliest imagery, such as the Room of Giant Spiders you find upon entering the loft, as well as an interaction you have with the brain of Mensis, who I will go ahead and say, probably gave me the most jitters of any great one because the whole build-up to finding this thing is just way too frightening. There's an elevator you gain access to after defeating Mikalash and heading up the middle section of the loft. And along this path, you're going to find other enemies that are frightening enough in their own right, like the Winter Lanterns and the Man-Eater Boars, now with a few extra sets of eyes around their faces just for some just for some additional nightmare fuel, you know? Everything from the level design to the more demented enemy variants, all the way to the scope of just how big and how brooding the nightmare area feels just really got to me on my first playthrough. And honestly, it still kinda does. Long before the plague, the School of Mensis founded a village, far below the greater parts of Yarnum, known as Yahar Ghul. And although you can arrive here prior to the Blood Moon phase of the game by getting kidnapped by the Snatchers, the Unseen Village's best and most jarring terrors become visible to you only during this ritual. Suddenly, there are these giant creatures hugging the taller buildings of the village that weren't there before. And there are chime maidens that bring forth Yahar Ghouls undead that patrol the village. I think the boss fight and the story behind its creation is what gives Yahar Ghoul and the School of Mensis such a horrifying backstory. It shows the School of Mensis in its most desperate moment to artificially create a great one through their experiments, resulting in the malformed atrocity that is the One Reborn. Using their newly acquired knowledge of the Eldritch Truth, the School of Mensis founded the village to see what exactly they could do with it, and what came of it was not only a failure, but a failure so massive that it would cost them the entire village, as most of the scholars immediately fled Yahar Ghul and just kinda left this monster to roam around. The Yahar Ghul Unseen Village houses some of the terrors that resulted from the school's abusive approach to its experimentation, and this is further evidence that the village was founded quite literally under Yarnum's nose. The entire town really feels like it shouldn't even be there, as though it were designed and created with a very malevolent intent behind it. The music ambience is one of the creepiest melodies I've ever heard, and it does a damn fine job at representing the helplessness you feel when exploring the village. A lot of things in the village don't feel like they have an explanation, which I think is a great representation of what the city and the Mensis experiments are supposed to be. It feels so out of place and just so outlandishly creepy that even if a hunter did find an explanation, they probably wouldn't even truly understand it. Yosefka's clinic is technically the first area that you find yourself immediately after regaining consciousness and starting the game. If you travel too far away from the door or encounter any beasts, the door locks behind you to prevent the blood from permeating the clinic. I mean, what else would you expect? Of course she isn't going to let you in. It is a clinic after all, but what exactly does this clinic really do? Well, this question certainly has its answers, but the details get foggy really quickly. Yosefka is a blood doctor that retains affiliation with the Healing Church. 
she administers her healing via blood transfusion, the healing church's staple and its go-to solution for, oh, pretty much anything, I guess. But being the newer player I was at this time, when I had all these questions, it certainly never occurred to me that you could actually find Yosefka's clinic and access it through a concealed underground path through the Forbidden Woods. Now, what's important here is a couple of visits after you routinely check in with Yosefka, try going there again. You'll notice that the lighting has changed, as well as the doctor's voice actor. That's not Yosefka you're talking to anymore, it's, it's an entirely different character. You can tell by the way she demands you send other, more sound humans to the clinic with hopes that they'll be cured and given a safe place to rest. If you do this, however, you will arrive at the clinic and observe what exactly happened to the people you sent there. Just about all of them will either be dead or turned into these blue celestial creatures. One of these celestials, in fact, drop an item labeled Yosefka's blood vial, which to me insinuates that whoever this imposter is, she ended up killing Yosefka and mutating her into one of these celestial beings. There's evidence of these experiments in other places around the clinic, such as an unconscious celestial on the leftmost wing of the building with a pretty human-looking arm, so as to communicate that whoever this subject was, they were in the middle of being transformed, but it looks like something stopped it short. This clinic has been fuel for constant theorizing among the player base. Some believe Yosefka was actually experimenting on Yarnum citizens and then turning them into these creatures before the imposter even arrived. Others believe Yosefka actually is the imposter we hear, only with the different voice intonation, as though she's finally given in to the plague. There are plenty of theories here that I could go into, and not a single one of them make the clinics seem like a peaceful place to be, so pick your poison. Above the church workshop, to the right of the cathedral ward, you're going to find a locked door that you unfortunately won't be able to access until much later in the game. The upper cathedral ward is just one giant fever dream, reinforced by a mob of brain suckers and a low droning ambience that constantly keeps the player on edge. Although this isn't my creepiest location on the list technically, the upper ward did probably house my single creepiest moment of vanilla Bloodborne at least. It's the moment where you're sort of tricked into thinking everything is fine and then suddenly hearing a loud crash, and then you look over to see the main chandelier has been knocked down by something. And then, two seconds later, you realize that exact same something is running up the cathedral stairs to come and claw your eyes out. Fun times. Fun times in the ward. What, a, uh, what an enjoyable place this is. And that's of course not forgetting about the classic window jump scare, where the game teases you with an item only exactly before dropping a giant wolf on your head through the window. If you were as oblivious as I was, and you didn't even consider that this could happen, then this moment is probably where a considerable lot of you shit your pants. I don't know, I guess I had spent the entirety of Bloodborne just kind of getting used to its rigid level design. There are no illusory walls in Bloodborne, if you, if you saw a wall, you knew there was no getting past it and the upper cathedral ward seems to shatter that rule, no pun intended, more than once, actually. The first time is here with the wolf jump scare, and then a few minutes later, you're required to break another window to access an optional boss fight in the Altar of Despair, and that's just not something I would have ever considered to do, I guess. Oh, and uh, not to mention the endless ocean of frenzy slugs that slide around the cathedral floors. Way too many times I stopped to check my inventory or something and closed everything down just in time to see one of these fine specimen nibbling at my leg. And then I had to go back into my inventory and frantically search for my sedatives because I knew what was coming next. Like I said, man, just fun times. Fun times in the cathedral ward. 
I don't really think that it's a huge secret or anything that the Healing Church has garnered a pretty negative reputation in Bloodborne's lore, but there is an area, specifically in the Old Hunters DLC, where we have the privilege of going back in Bloodborne's timeline and really getting an eyeful of the Healing Church at some of its worst and most desperate moments. The research hall in the Old Hunters DLC is by far one of the most unsettling places in the entirety of Bloodborne. There is a lot to unpack here in this clinic, but I'm gonna try and condense it as much as I can. The research hall in the Astral Clock Tower area, in a nutshell, is a really dark and brooding window into some of the Healing Church's more malicious experiments, as well as some of the horrifying consequences their patients sometimes fell victim to. These patients, with massively enlarged heads, aimlessly wander the research hall. You can collect brain fluid from some of the enlar some of the enlarged heads with dialogue, and as per its item description, some of the patient's heads have enlarged and expanded so massively that it eventually became all that they were. I frequently have very chilling thoughts about what some of these heads would look like had they not been hidden in all the wraps and bandages that conceal them. It um probably wouldn't be a very appetizing sight, to be sure. And it's throughout these halls where we hear murmurs that sound insane and irrational at first, but you have to remember the principle of insight and the role it plays in Bloodborne. Just because something sounds insane or deranged to you doesn't exactly mean they aren't telling you the truth. Some of the patients have yet to be morphed into these large heads, and they refer to the distant sound of dripping water coming from just above them. The name that gets repeated in a lot of these dialogue lines is Lady Maria, being mentioned over and over again by most of the patients in the hall. And if this doesn't seem that significant to you, then, well, that's only because you've yet to explore the very next and final area in the Old Hunter's expansion. And this next area that I speak of is where it all happens. All of the pieces slowly begin putting themselves together. It's here at this small and seemingly insignificant fishing hamlet the one that Lady Maria so desperately tried to hide from your character, where Bergenworth, the School of Mensis, the Scourge, the Hunter's Nightmare, all of it finally begins making sense. The Fishing Hamlet is by far the darkest and most depressing, and just in general, the creepiest location in all of Yarnum and in Bloodborne. This fishing hamlet may seem to hold relatively little significance, but that's, well, that's just the thing. Everything about the way this area is built holds immense importance to piecing together what exactly happened and why all of this suffering throughout Yarnum is even necessary in the first place. Firstly, you can see a reflection of Yarnum through the bottom of the lake, which sort of implies that not only have we transcended the plane of that dimension, but we are also physically above it, which explains why all the patients in the research hall heard dripping water. Here we see not only the malevolence of the Bergenworth College and how they violated the inhabitants of this hamlet, but also the wrath of the great ones these villagers called upon the wrath of Mother Cause herself. As punishment for Bergenworth's trespassings, both the scholars of the college and their successors, the hunters of the church and the workshop, were basically cursed to hunt beasts for all eternity. And so, whenever they died, they would wake up again at the hunter's refuge as though it were all just a bad dream. Not even death was enough to escape the curse. The scholars and their successors were forced to stay alive and hunt. Hunt for the rest of time. As Garriman says in the very beginning, it's for our own good. It's just what hunters do, after all. The enemy design is fantastically disgusting. They just, they give off this amphibious, albeit humanoid appearance. They grip their weapons and attack like humans, but 
The death screams of these fish villagers when killed sound really gurgly, almost as though their lungs had already collapsed from drowning. And the sharks, f fucking hell, dude, just just don't even get me started. I, I need to control myself. And if I start writing about the sharks, I'm going to be here talking for 10 more minutes. So I'm just going to say they're, they're fucking scary, and I'm just going to leave it at that. Bloodborne is a wonderful Lovecraftian rabbit hole of horrors and insanity, and the deluge of references and bits of creepy information just seem to never stop. It's been almost five years, and every now and then you still see a new post on the Bloodborne subreddit asking for first-time advice on Father Gascoigne. It really is just insane how this player base still continues to expand, even after five years. A marvelously unsettling level design that's reinforced with the melancholy of humanity, desperately clinging to what little sanity it has left. If there's even any left at all. If there was a moment that you think I skimmed over, or a specific area you didn't see here that scared you more than it did me, then feel free to let me know about it. I'm Rusty, and I'll see you next time.